Hello everyone and a warm welcome to the first live webinar from the Water Management Society. My name is Elise Maynard and I'm your chair today for today's webinar, Water Microbiology Testing Made Easy, which is being given by Dr. Paul McDermott. We are very grateful to IDEX for hosting this webinar and supporting the Society with an educational grant. The Water Management Society is a not-for-profit membership organisation that has been providing practical and technical training solutions to individuals and companies within the water management industry over 40 years. By gathering expertise from every sector of the industry, the Society can offer informed and professional assistance in all matters relating to the responsible management of water, both in industry and commerce. They achieve this through training courses, events, publications and journals, and in addition to these, the Midlands-based offices accommodate a unique on-site practical training area for hands-on experience. Members come from a wide range of disciplines, including water suppliers, scientists, engineers, manufacturers, consultants, and facilities managers. Applications are welcomed from those within in the relevant industries, both in the UK and overseas. Today, we have 122 registered participants. We'll be holding a question and answer session at the conclusion of today's presentation, and you may ask a question at any time by entering it into the Q&A panel at the lower right of your screen. If you experience technical difficulty at any time during this WebEx event, please submit to your technical issue in the Q&A panel, and our technical support team will endeavour to assist. All attendees will be in a listen-only mode throughout the duration of today's webinar, and it is being recorded and it will be available for YouTube clip uh, sometime, sometime during next week, and we'll inform you of that. I would now like to speak to today's webinar, Dr. Paul McDermott. I've known Paul for many years now, and we can often be found co-tutoring or lecturing on behalf of the society. Paul has a PhD in microbiology and spent the first five years, sorry, first years of his career in microbiology research and as a university lecturer. He then worked as a specialist inspector in the Health and Safety Executive's Biological Agents Unit, working in the field of occupational Legionella risk control. Paul was an active member of the HSE's Legionella Committee and Technical walk Working Groups and has acted as an ex expert witness in a number of Legionella enforcement cases. Understandably, he's contributed to the production of numerous related guidance documents. Paul is also a technical assessor for the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, UCAS, for Legionella Risk Assessment Services. And since setting up his own consultancy in 2014, Paul undertakes the role of a water safety authorising engineer at a number of NHS trusts and provides advice and training for a number of others, including a number of large academic institutions. He's a member of the Water Management Society and a fellow of the Royal Society of Public Health. Welcome, Paul, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks, Elise, uh, and welcome, everybody, to the webinar. Um, rapid microbiological testing has been the subject of much debate over recent years and is the focus of this webinar. I'll be talking about one of the rapid testing options available, the most probable number, or MPN, approach, which uses a defined substrate. One of the tests is for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and the other one is for Legionella pneumophila. These tests are very simple to conduct, and because of this, it introduces the very real possibility that some of the routine testing that we do, particularly in situations where the degree of testing is very high, can be done in-house. This has the potential not only to speed up the process, but can also offer other practical advantages which I'll be discussing. In-house testing using the MPN method is currently being used in a number of hospital trusts where extensive testing, extensive microbiological testing is routinely carried out, but it also has the potential for use in other industry sectors where similarly large amounts of uh, microbi microbiological testing is conducted. And it's, uh, for example, that could be uh, leisure industries, cruise industries, and also in higher education. So this is what I want to talk about today. I'd like to start by discussing why it is that we conduct microbiological monitoring and what the regula regulator has to say about it. 
I'll talk about some of the problems that are commonly encountered and how these might be addressed by in-house testing and using the rapid MPN methods. I'll also talk about how we can test and effect sorry, how we can attest how we can test effectively and more importantly how we can test safely. I'll also talk about some of the perceived potential drawback, drawbacks, in particular the need for all microbiological testing to be performed in UCAS accredited laboratories and the old species versus new muffler chestnut. Finally, I'll show some of the testimonies provided by hospital trusts that have adopted the MPN method for testing for Pseudomonas aeruginosa for its routine testing in augmented care areas. So, let's get started. I think it's important to understand why we take samples, test for the presence of microorganisms. It really does need to be set in the wider context of the overall monitoring program for control to check the controls that we have put in place are effective and that they remain that way. In Great Britain, we have a legal duty to do this under the Control of Substances as a System Health Regulations and the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations. Those amongst you who are health and safety enlightened will know that the approved Code of Practice for the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations was withdrawn in 2013 and replaced with the Health and Safety Guide, HSG 65, Managing for Health and Safety. Monitoring uh, of control measures is an important and integral part of the Plan Do Check Act model for health and safety management. And it's one that's in, uh, promoted fully by the health and safety executive. It's the measuring and reviewing performance part in the checking and acting part of the cycle. As well as routine monitoring activities that can be planned in advance, there is also a lot of the need for reactive sampling and testing. For example, in response to out of spec monitoring results for water temperatures or biocides, or in response to clinical surveillance information in healthcare situations. So, when do we need to sample and test? Let's start with Legionella. It's a tricky question, really, and it's probably a case of horses for courses. In Great Britain, we have the approved Code of Practice uh, and its Associated Health and Safety Guidance Series, HST 274, which is published by the Health and Safety Executive, as well as, it, as, well as the Department of Health, Health Technical Memorandum Series, HTM 0401. In healthcare, the frequency and location of testing should be decided by risk assessment, and the programme of testing decided by the Water Safety Group or the Water Safety Management Team. Routine testing is rec recommended in high-risk wards where patients are more susceptible to Legionella infection, for example, in haematology oncology wards, organ transplant wards, cardio renal wards. Health and Safety Executive recommends that outside of healthcare where temperature control has, be has replaced has been replaced with chemical controls, the testing is performed until confidence has been gained in the efficacy of those control measures. Microbiological monitoring is also recommended in situations where other monitoring data, for example, temperature and biocide levels, have indicated that control is not being achieved consistently. And of course, any microbiological sampling for Legionella should also be considered and conducted in the event of a single case or an outbreak in hospitals and elsewhere. How many hospital trusts actually follow the guidance to the letter is perhaps open to question, but the bottom line is that most hospitals undertake extensive testing, and whilst this can provide assurances that control measures are being uh, maintained, it comes at some considerable cost. So if and when the initial samples that we've taken return positive results, further sampling is usually necessary. And the Department of Health guidance provides some helpful advice on the frequency of resampling. Depending on whether the results are obtained pre or post flush, uh, depending on the level of counts returned and whether samples were taken from high risk areas, the frequency of sampling can vary. Resampling after remediation within the recommended timescales can prove problematic, especially if the sampling is required immediately after. Scheduling in third-party contractors, which is the most common approach to 
to this, to take the samples for processing with a minimum delay can be very difficult. What about Pseudomonas aeruginosa? Well, the Department of Health guidance advises that routine sampling is usually only required in augmented care areas, but may also be required in response to clinical surveillance information. Augmented care areas are not defined in general terms. These are areas where patients are highly vulnerable to all forms of infection and might include those high-risk areas for Legionnaire's disease, as well as others such as neonatal intensive care wards, where premature babies with very naive immune systems receive care and are particularly vulnerable to pseudomonas original infection. Although this type of testing is more defined and restricted to certain areas of the hospital, it still represents a significant amount of work, even if routine testing is only performed six monthly, as recommended in the guidance. Because of the various ways that augmented care outlets can become contaminated with, this, with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, outlets can be contaminated by touching by hands, patients, uh, visited healthcare workers, can also be, become contaminated by inappropriate cleaning activities and the disposal of materials such as patient wash water and clinical hand, uh, hand wash basins. Because of this, there's a, a high likelihood of significant numbers of positive returns in the first sweep of testing. This then leads trusts into the remediation retesting cycle. This is where the problems really begin. Scheduling visits by third party contractors to meet retesting requirements after three days, two weeks and four weeks, those are following negative results, can be enormously problematic, particularly when remediation activities vary in both what might need to be done and when it's possible to actually do it. This presents a significant headache for both trusts and its contractors and can lead to serious delays in the, in the safe return of outlets to use. Some other common problems that we encounter generally. Pre-flush samples that give an indication of local contamination of an outlet and which is recommended for routine testing by routine testing for Pseudomonas aeruginosa need to be taken following the period when the outlet has been idle for at least two hours. That's if we're to follow the Department of Health guidance in HTM 0401. This can be challenging, particularly for third party contractors who would likely need to be on site in the very early hours of the morning or in the middle of the night in order to be able to obtain a genuine pre flush sample. In-house sampling could help improve the chances of obtaining genuine pre-flush samples, for example, by using uh, uh, shift teams in the estates department. Samples, whether for Legionella or for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, must first be taken, then transported to the laboratory, processed, incubated, results interpreted, reports compiled, and then sent back to the trust for analysis. Work orders or job tickets then need to be raised and distributed to estate teams. Remedial actions need to be taken and arrangements made for resampling and testing. You can see how the delays are caused. Transport conditions and timings are crucial to the reliability of any microbiological testing. This can present a challenge to third party contractors. For Legionella, this is perhaps more straightforward than for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Third party contractors are much more experienced in taking water samples for Legionella analysis. They've been doing it for years and there's no requirement for refrigeration of samples uh, if you follow the guidance in the British standard BS7592. Nevertheless, there are challenges. Separating hot and cold water samples and protecting them from heat, usually by using separate pool boxes requires good planning and the correct equipment. When large numbers of samples are required to be taken in one go, which is often the case because it's most convenient and therefore the preferred method, there may also be manual handling issues, especially if numerous one litre samples are taken. For Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the situation is very different and the challenge is likewise. This may be because this type of sampling is relatively new to contractors certainly compared to Legionella sampling. And ensuring the cold chain is maintained is vitally important, but can be problematic. 
if samples are not maintained uh, as required during transport and processed within the time frames recommended in the standards, then the validity of the results is entirely questionable and they're very difficult to interpret. One of the principal advantages of the MPN methodologies is that neither seed alert nor lead alert require confirmatory tests. This makes both tests more rapid than conventional poultry methods and other rapid, other rapid detection techniques. As well as simplifying and speeding up the testing procedure, incubation periods are roughly half those required for traditional methods. Interpreting the results is also much more straightforward compared to conventional plate poultry methods. Any testing lab will be very pleased to read the plate as uniformly scattered with conings as the one that's on the slide. But anybody who's worked in a uh, Legionella testing lab will, say, will, will tell you that that's not often the case. And counting colonies on most uh, plates requires a practice eye. So what's the answer? Well, in Great Britain anyway, current national guidance is surprisingly silent on the matter and provides little in the way of guidance on the type of alternative methods that can be considered and the relative, relative merits of them. However, the Water Management Society has produced a range of fact sheets which look at, the num look at a number of different options. And uh, these include PCR or the polymerase chain reaction they also include immunomagnetic separation techniques, as well as another uh, technique called MOLDITOF, which stands for Matrix-Assisted Laser Disorption Ionization Time of Flight. So it's a bit of a mouthful. That's why they call it MOLDITOF. Um, however, the latter is more useful, really, in identifying different bacteria rather than counting them for routine monitoring purposes. The fact sheet also covered the IDEX methods for MPN for the enum enumeration of of Legionella pneumophila and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Another of the really important features of the MPN method is, is that as well as giving rapid confirmed results, the numbers derived from the tests are scientifically equivalent to those from plate culture. This was discussed in an article in the Water Management Society's Waterland magazine by David Saltori. So in other words, the MPN per unit volume is equivalent to the CFU or colony forming unit per unit volume. And this has the advantages, the advantage, principal advantage, of allowing comparison with the action levels that are provided in HSG 274. Elise has given you a little bit about my background and as a health and safety or former health and safety executive inspector, you'd expect me to say something about risk assessment. So I won't disappoint. It's important to remember that any activity that is undertaken that has the potential to give rise to risks is properly assessed. It's a requirement under POSH, Regulation 6, and also the Management of Health and Safety at Work, Regulations, Regulation 3. If a number, sorry, if in-house sampling and testing is to be done, consideration needs to be given to a number of issues, not least the process of sample collection. Ensuring that this is done in a manner that does not put the, the sample at risk, but perhaps more importantly, that samples are taken in a way that doesn't allow cross-contamination from one outlet or ward to another is of paramount importance. And the risk assessment must help identify effective controls that need to be put in place. We also have to remember that both pseudolert and legionlert involve the propagation of harmful bacteria and appropriate controls need to be in place to ensure safety during incubation of the quantity trays and also when reading the results. There also needs to be an effective means of safe storage of spent quantity trays and their disposal via the clinical waste stream or similar. Of course, any in-house sampling and testing needs to be conducted by trained and competent individuals. The Water Management Society has launched its City and Guilds accredited training course that provides those given these tasks with the appropriate level of competence to ensure that procedures are conducted in a manner that ensures that the potential for cross-contamination during sampling is avoided 
and that tests are carried out and results interpreted properly and safely. Some trusts have already assembled water safety teams and the in-house sampling and testing approach is ideally suited to this. Effective quality assurance is also required and this can be achieved readily using the same QC materials as for traditional testing. Right, so what about UCAS accreditation? UCAS, uh, as Elise said, is the United Kingdom Accreditation Service and is the UK's national accredita accreditation body and is responsible, if you look at their website, for determining in the public interest the technical competence and integrity of organisations such as those offering testing, calibration and certification services. I should know this because, as you've heard, I'm a UCAS technical assessor albeit not for labs, but for Legionella Risk Assessment Services. And there's no doubt that, the, uh, the, that the, the role of UCAS is important in that respect. But what does guidance say about UCAS accreditation? Well, the Health and Safety Guide 274 recommends that samples taken for Legionella analysis are processed and the results interpreted in laboratories that are being accredited to ISO 17025. HTM 401 Part B recommends the same and extends this to total viable count testing. It is, however, silent on the matter when it comes to testing for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, so why the recommendation for UCAS accreditation? Well, in my mind, it reflects the complexity of the laboratory techniques that are required to perform conventional tests, which require technical specialism. The MPN tests that I've described remove these complexities and the proven reliability of the test kits means that UCAS accreditation is likely to be necessary for most, if not all, routine and reactive testing. Labs using the test would almost certainly seek accreditation, but here I'm not talking about labs, I'm more talking about the practicalities of coping with huge amounts of testing and the logistics of testing. So what else does the regulator say about UCAS accreditation? Well, although HSE's technical guidance recommends analysis of, analysis of Legionella samples by UCAS accredited laboratories, it also allows for flexibility in this respect. And it says alternative testing methods may be used provided that they have been validated using ISO 17994 and meet the required sensitivity and specificity. My take on this, and I was involved in the drafting of HST 274, is that provided the test, in this case Legilert, has undergone an evaluation against conventional, for example, membrane filtration methods, using the procedures specified in ISO 17994, and meets or exceeds the required sensitivity and specificity, then the guidance in HST 274 has been followed. A little bit more on that later. It's also worth noting what the regulator, HSE, says about its guidance documents. There is often a misconception about what is required of duty holders and the relative status of regulations, ACOPs and guidance. The inside cover of most HSE guidance documents provides an explanation, but this is often overlooked, and that's probably because it's tucked away on the inside cover. It's quite clear, though. It says following the guidance is not compulsory, unless it's specifically stated, which it isn't for sampling and testing for Legionella, and you are free to take other action. So provided the other action is equally effective, or better, more on that later too, then you're not committing any kind of offence. Let's think about traditional culture methods and use testing for Legionella as an example. These methods use complex microbiological techniques require a high degree of technical specialism and competence. Microbiologists that conduct this work will have undertaken years of training to develop this competence, and the techniques require specialist laboratory facilities and equipment, which must be validated and maintained. Interpreting the results of tests requires a trained eye and lots of experience, but can also be highly subjective, and final results can depend on the individual given the task, to some degree at least. 
And that really is why UCAS accreditation is required for those types of tests. The, techno the, the, the complexities of the tests are removed when you use the MPN methods. So there are some of the advantages, but what might the drawbacks be? One issue of this thus is a pneumophila versus species argument, with many people laboring under the misconception that L8 and HSG 274 require testing to be formed for species. In fact, this isn't true. Out of roughly 350 pages of guidance, that's including the HSC guidance, the Department of Health guidance, Legionella species is mentioned less than a handful of times. Testing for species, pneumophila, zero group one, zero group two to 15 are not specifically uh, mentioned. This reflects the nature of microbiological monitoring and its place in the overall monitoring program. It's also because it's widely recognized that if conditions exist that are conducive to the growth of one species of Legionella, then it's likely that others will be there too. These are the latest figures from Public Health England. Very illuminating and I would say pretty conclusive. It's clear from these data that Legionella pneumophila is by far the most significant species in the genus with respect to cases of illness in England and Wales, accounting for by far the lion's share of all cases of Legionella disease in 2014 and 2015, and all of the cases in 2016. So, if we're going to look for a particular species of Legionella, then testing for pneumophila is surely the most logical. So the potential benefits of in-house testing using rapid methods, to me anyway, are clear. It allows greater flexibility in both the initial testing and during the retesting cycle. Results are returned much more quickly. This allows remedial works to be scheduled ineffectively and timely checks to be performed on the efficacy of those remedial actions. Outlets can be returned to use, enhancing patient care with assurances that patient safety is not being compromised. There is a huge potential cost saving, which could be channeled towards more frequent testing, something that I think most hospital trusts are considering for pseudomonas Pseudomon aeruginosa testing. The six monthly interval currently advised in HTML 401 being recognized as too infrequent to provide sufficient, insu sufficient assurance of outlet safety in augmented care areas. Some trusts have opted to use a combination of in-house testing using Pseudalert and other conventional sampling and testing methods. This approach has even received some endorsement by Public Health England. So how reliable are the tests? Studies have shown that both Pseudalert and Legialert are highly sensitive, specific for their target organisms and the test results are highly reproducible. The tests, as I said, are very simple to conduct and the results are easy to interpret using simple reference to MPN tables. Pseudolet was recently accepted by the Standing Committee of Analysts, Microbiology of Drinking Waters, no less, as a recommended method for testing for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Its performance against standard plate culture methods has been assessed against ISO 17994 and it compares extremely favourably, something which you might remember is mentioned expressly in the HSC guidance. In addition, similar independent studies on lead alert have shown enhanced sensitivity and specificity compared to plate culture. And has been, and has been said, compared to conventional approaches, the tests are extremely rapid, reducing delays in reporting of results. A little bit about Pseudalert. It's recently received international recognition and was published as the new ISO 162662 worldwide standard for the 24 hour detection of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudalert is also specified as an alternative method for the analysis of drinking water and recreational water in Germany and it received NF validation by AFNOR in France. 
similar endorsements are expected in due course for Legia Alert. So there's plenty of national and international support for this type of approach to facilitate routine testing for these pathogens. And some organisations in the UK have already adopted Pseudalert for their routine testing for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But don't take my word for it. This are, these are some testimonies this one from Ben Rainey, he was the former Water Safety Manager at St George's University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust. And this is what he had to say. He was able to carry out remedial works and retest the same day. He was able to assess whether remedial works had been effective or not. He was able to identify uh, which types of remedial work were effective. He also said the kit was easy to use and the turnaround time between taking tests and receiving results, so taking samples and receiving results, was much quicker. And he would highly recommend it to other hospitals. This one from Paul Balaam, who's a senior estates officer at King's College NHS Foundation Trust. They used Pseudalert for on-site testing following positive results within the third test, with the third test in conjunction, in conjunction with that conducted by an independent laboratory. Public Health England, who visited the hospital and were interested in the uh, monitoring arrangement for pseudomonas, confirmed that this was indeed a very suitable arrangement. Paul reckon, uh, also said that uh, the results had res resulted in considerable savings and following a recent sweep of an augmented care area, they were able to carry out remedial works, retest, and return outlets to use in a much shorter time span than previously. And this one from Phil Mitchell, who's the environmental estates officer in John Radcliffe at John Radcliffe Hospital. For us, IDEX Sudbert was a game changer. We were able to get test results in a much shortened time frame. Uh, they also exhibited a degree of healthy cynicism, I would say. They wanted to make sure that the test results uh, produced was reliable, results-wise. Uh, and so they decided to take back-to-back -back samples, split samples essentially, one going to the labs and one staying with us and, uh, and using Pseudalert. And the results were impressive. And any sort of deviations from the results, they felt they had a, 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 great, a good reason to explain those. And this one from my friend uh, down in Brighton, Nev Clark, who's the Deputy Director of uh, Facilities and Estates. He says, I'm sure that these will afford us the opportunity to increase patient safety, reduce clinical down, down, downtime, as well as reduce costs. So that's about it from me. I'm happy to take questions. Elise, do we have any? We do. So just a, a quick uh, announcement for those people who are, are still online, which is plenty of you, so thank you for that. Um, if you want to have CPD certificates for listening in to the webinar, uh, you'll need to contact admin at umsoc.org.uk, um, or you can go onto the Water Management Society webpage and the contact details are there, and I'll repeat that at the end of the uh, the uh, question and answers as well. So, yes, uh, quite a few questions, thank you, Paul. So, um, Fire away. <laughs> right, for the for both the Legulert or and the Sudlert, is there a need for additional confirmation by plate count, which was required for previous rapid test methods, or has this gone? Well, I think that's one of the, the, the principal advantages of both tests, is that these are confirmed tests. So when you get a positive on Pseudolert, you know that it's Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And when you get a positive on Legionella, you know that it's Legionella pneumophila. So certainly with, with the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that's a, a big saving in time. Okie dokie. And then we've got um, some more information um, which has been provided about the Legionella Pneumophila, I think, for World Health Organization, which shows slightly different statistics. Oh. Um, but 
I think they were saying 70% in, in that, but I, I don't know um, when that was published, but we've got a link which we can provide. Well, I mean, the, 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 um, the figures I've shown well, there, at least. Again, what's the, oh, go on. Uh, okay. So I think they're uh, sort of preempting, really saying, is there any information from the World Health Organization or CDC that only Legionella should be tested? And I, I think that's what some of the regulatory um, bodies, the uh, European Drinking Water Directive, for example, are looking at at the moment. Is that they are. Understanding? Yeah. So what, do we should we be testing for pneumophila or should we be testing for Legionella? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, the guidance doesn't say you should test for pneumophila. It doesn't say you should you should test for different sera groups. Um, it just tests, it says that under certain circumstances, it might be appropriate to test for Legionella as part of your overall monitoring regime. And I think that's important. The reason, I think in the UK certainly, for that is because testing for doing additional tests to determine whether what you've got on your plate, for example, if you're using plate culture, is pneumophila or pneumophila serial group 1 or pneumophila serial group 2 to 15, that in introduces additional steps. Um, and those steps come at a cost. Uh, and there's a time delay in doing that as well. So HSE wouldn't, would, would, it would be wrong of HSE to impose additional burdens on duty holders who are using or, or conducting microbiological sampling as part of their uh, routine monitoring by requiring them to do more than test whether Legionella, well, well actually what you're doing is you're testing to see whether the conditions that are in that water system are conducive to Legionella growth. And in actual fact, you don't need to test for pneumophila. You don't need to test for uh, species. What you're doing is testing to see whether Legionella will grow there. The thing with uh, Legionella is that it actually, it actually picks up more Legionella pneumophila than traditional culture methods pick up of Legionella species. So it's more sensitive than traditional methods. So if you're looking for, if, if you really want your your test to tell you whether you've got Legionella in your system, then the MPN methods are, are, are probably more likely to be able to do that. Well, they will do that more efficiently for you. I think that's covered somebody else's question about giving higher uh, detection um, or incidence than plate count methods. So that's that. Um, so another question about who these tests might be appropriate for. So whether you'd want to be doing that within a a hospital laboratory by qualified personnel, or could it be done by in-house maintenance, for example? Well, it's 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 whatever you want, really. Um, I think the tests are so simple to conduct; they they really are. That uh, anybody, not anybody, but you know, states uh, personnel could easily be trained, and have been trained, as we know. To, uh, to to carry out these uh, th those procedures uh, and actually reading the results, which is often where the you know the, the real specialism comes in, is is incredibly straightforward as well. It's just a question of counting the number of positive wells and then comparing that to a, a simple MPN table. So I think it's it it, it can it the, the simplicity of the of the tests lends itself to uh, anybody actually being, being able to, to do the test. You don't need a uh, sophisticated laboratory to do it either. Um, there is an issue, of course, as I mentioned, about um, ensuring that the, uh, the quantity trays are incubated safely and that you read them safely. As I say, for Legionella, you're going, you have viable Legionella pneumophila uh, bacteria in those quantity trays, they're sealed. And for, for Pseudalert, likewise, you've got viable Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So it's important that you have facilities that allow that to be done safely and you've got the, um, the facility to, to dispose of that material appropriately as well. So that's, that's important. I mean, in terms of laboratories, uh, I, I would guess that you know, in the future uh, a, a lot of testing laboratories may well consider using lead alert and pseudo alert in their laboratories. Uh, 
you know, it, you, you don't you don't necessarily need a laboratory to do it. But if you if you're doing that, if that's your your line of business, you, you're you're testing water samples for for those bacteria, then why wouldn't you use a method which is uh, quicker and potentially cheaper than other methods? Okay, and that brings us uh, onto another question about um, training and and uh, courses and stuff like that. Uh, because obviously UCAS is a certain amount of um, regulatory requirements. So if you were going to do that in house, um, how would you manage that? The training well, aspect? the training. Well, as as I said, you know the the, the techniques themselves. Uh, require a certain level of training and you know the water management society provides a city and guilds training course that, that addresses that i think the the biggest issue is in sh in terms of training and competence is not so much in, in conducting the tests they are as i say very very straightforward it's more in the collection of samples and as i said principally in ensuring that when those samples are being taken that they're taken in a way that doesn't increase the chances or introduce the opportunity for cross-contamination from one area uh, of a ward into another area or from ward to ward. And that is really where I think the, what the City and Guilds training uh, comes into its own. It's making sure that people are aware of those risks, that they have in place uh, appropriate controls to, to manage those risks. Thank you. Um, and again, just some clarification about the test, uh, whether it's the pseudolite test, whether it's specific to originosa, or does it cover all species? No, it's, it's specific for pseudomonas originosa. But that's that's a good thing, because of the number of um, species that sit within that genus, uh, there's a handful that, that, that can cause a disease in, in, uh, in humans. But by far and away, the the most important pathogen is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and we don't wouldn't routinely test for some of the others. Pseudomonas putida can cause can has been known to cause uh, disease in, in severely immunocompromised individuals. But when we look in look at the data and we look at the in in hospitals, it's Pseudomonas aeruginosa that cause causes by far and away the most number of infections. So it's the most important. A pathogen within that genus. Okay. And then another question about the scope for using the uh, Ligia Alert in a hospital laboratory, and I guess that's for um, environmental testing, not clinical testing. Yes. Yeah. This, this is this is designed for. It's not for for clinical testing. Uh, th these kits are being designed for, for testing water. And but like I say, okay. it can be done in a um, in a, in a hospital laboratory. But Um, and I think my understanding is that a number of um, laboratories are, uh, hospital laboratories are doing more environmental testing um, in some cases as well to, to get that control over their sampling, etc. Yes. Yeah. Um, questions about um, equipment setup costs and unit costs for tests, which I don't know whether you would be able to answer or whether we would um, hand that question over to, to IDEX to contact. Uh, well, I, I can, what I can say is that the the amount of equipment, because I've seen it used, is is well, it's, it's not a lot. You need um, a sealer to seal the quantity trays. You need the reagents, and then you need a, an incubator that's able to be set at the required temperature. And the temperature for incubation is is crucial, so you can't skimp on that. Um, but in terms of costs. I, I couldn't say. Uh, my advice would be, if you're interested, would be to contact Ardex and ask them for a, for a figure or a deal. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I think that's coming towards the end of our questions um, now. So I think perhaps if, if I just say, um, say thank you to, to, to you, Paul, um, and also just really to uh, well to extend our thanks to you and, and to everybody for for dialing in um, as, as I said I think somebody didn't hear me earlier but uh, we actually had 122 uh, people that had registered 
so some of those will be getting the YouTube um, link at some point, and I'll, I'll talk you through how to get that. Uh, but thank you also to our participants for your excellent questions. And again, uh, many thanks to IDEX for supporting this event. Um, these, it's very important to the society as a not-for-profit organization to um, to help with these very um, scientific presentations. So the content for, from today's webinar will be available on the Water Management Society website members page, uh, hopefully some point next week. If you wish to join, uh, then obviously this information will be easy to access in the future. And for your CPD points and certificates, please contact admin at watermanagementsociety.org.uk. Uh, once again, if you want to access that YouTube video, it will be on the Water Management Society page. You're welcome to get in touch with us at admin at watermanagementsociety.co.uk. So that's admin at wmsoc.co.uk, sorry, .org.uk, if you have any comments or questions about the content from this or any future webinars which you will be planning from early 2019. So many thanks for listening, and please enjoy the rest of your day.